Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Llewellyn. Um, I run services at medcomsnetworking.com and the associated website. So these are information, resources, services, activities for the global medcoms community, by which I mean people who work in and around medical communications, medical education, medical publishing, and so on, the associated businesses, and indeed um, uh, for people who want to know more about medcoms and maybe with a view to getting a job in medcoms. Um, you'll find lots of information at medcomsnetworking.com. You'll find lots of information about the business at first medcoms job first medcoms job.com if i can say it um those of you who are interested in a career in the business uh, and you'll find lots and lots there's now hundreds of videos at network pharma tv many of which have come out of webinars like this uh, the great thing about these webinars is we can involve people from all over the world um, and we've got another good international audience with us today um absolutely delighted we've got the the guys here from langland uh, we're going to talk strategy today guys aren't we so um without further ado i'm going to hand over to annette to kick us off well, thanks so much. So um, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for having us, Peter. Um, my name's uh, Annette Keith. I head up our editorial team, so that's all our medical writers here at Langland. Um, I think it's always a really good day when you get to take a step back from the day-to-day, -day, really, uh, and really think about what we do and how we do it and have that opportunity to explore that with um, your professional community. So this is a really great platform for that. Um, so thanks so much to everyone who's joined and, and as Peter said we'd really love to get your thoughts and a good discussion going um, after our presentation so please do use that chat function um, and share your, your thoughts and, and questions uh, during the course of things and Peter will pick those up uh, at, at the Q&A. We don't have a lot of slides to run through so there's going to be plenty of time uh, for that discussion. Just very quickly to set the scene, um, I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with Langland, um, we're a medcoms agency uh, made up of four different disciplines. Uh, so that's clinical trial experience, medical strategy and education, advertising, and PR and policy. And while each of those disciplines has its own clients and its own projects, more and more we're finding ourselves supporting our clients with a cross agent, uh, cross multidisciplinary teams really from across the full agency. So what we wanted to do today was to present how we approach that challenge uh, from the strategic thinking and planning right through to the execution and how some of the different functions and roles uh, provide value and work together uh, along the way. Uh, I'm sure that I speak for everyone who's on this call. I think we're probably quite a selected group where, where we really we really strive to, to do the best quality work for our clients and, and be the best partners to them and indeed to evolve the way we work um, to do things for the better. So as well as being very happy to answer questions um, at the end of our presentation, we'd love to open out the discussion to, to the audience. We think we've got quite a unique approach having um, the four different disciplines within the same agency and therefore no barriers or limitations on collaboration. But we know that agencies come in all shapes and sizes. There's not a one size fits all approach. And we'd really love to hear how you do things, what's worked, what's not worked, how you think you know, we can do things better. Um, so it's really got, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> a great opportunity to, to learn from each other. So um, our webinar is titled The Power of Teamwork from Strategy to Execution. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Louis, who's going to start the ball rolling. Oh, unmute myself. So that's the first faux pas <laughs> of the way. Um, so hopefully the screen is visible to everybody. But yeah, thank you for passing over, Annette. Um, I think just, just to kind of give us an opportunity to introduce ourselves as well as the other panelists. So um, as, a, as Annette mentioned, we're, we're made up of four different disciplines that sit within Langland. Uh, I myself sit within the, the advertising department um, as an associate planning director. Um, what, what you will see throughout this presentation is that we are using planning and strategy synonymously. So in many ways, what, what I'm responsible for is, is brand strategy. And we will, we will come on to that um, in, in a little bit. But uh, essentially, if I was to boil it down, my job is to, and it's become my mantra uh, right now, is to, to make the complex simple. And um, so I'll pass over to, to Emily. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm Emily McGuire. So I'm a senior science book strategist. So um, I kind of live within the MSE, but I also bridge um, across advertising as well. And um, I kind of won't dwell on it too much just now, so we'll get into how we work with the brand planners or strategists um, on that side and specifically kind of what our role is. But it's very much about taking that um, scientific and how we help with the direction and the strategy from a scientific perspective. Um, hi everyone, I'm, uh, I'm Kelly Rook, I'm a Principal Medical Writer at Langland and um, 
the writers are obviously uh, responsible for the kind of content generation, but we work very closely with um, both the planners and the scientific strategists to make sure that we're aligned and um, that we have a collaborative approach to how we're going to create the foundation of the content. And um, it's uh, we take it very seriously to have a really nice collaborative approach to make sure that we bring most value for each of our um, roles in the content generation. Brilliant. Thank you, Kelly. And you guys will just see a little note there as well. Um, and again, just to reiterate that if you do hear anything that interests you today, we'd love to speak to you. So please do get in touch, reach out and um, start a conversation. Um, so, I mean, before we kind of go into how we work collaboratively as a team um, here at Langland um, across both um, strategy and, um, and, and writing as well and content creation, um, we thought what we would do is give um, you know, a brief introduction to strategy as, a, uh, as, a, as an idea, as a discipline, um, and, and, and go from there, really, because it is in many ways a unique offering um, at Langland is the, is the idea of scientific strategy in combination with brand strategy as two clearly defined roles. Um, but to step up to, from a really high level, um, as I said earlier, you know, we make the complex simple, um, but really, if we boil it down even further, why our clients get in touch with us is because they want to overcome a challenge. And it's our role to, to really start to design a way, a system, a process that will allow for that challenge to be overcome, whether it be through, um, through writing, through creative or, or whatever the ask is or whatever the challenge demands, really. Um, I also just want to go into a brief, a little bit of a brief history um, with regards to, uh, to to strategy and planning as a whole. Um, I'm sure a lot of people on the line um, are, you know, reasonably familiar with this. Um, but this came from Stephen King, um, not the author, not the horror author, a, a very different man, uh, known as the Godfather of planning, um, out of JWT in the 70s. Um, and really what this did was set up strategy and planning as, 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 as clear disciplines and take them out of the hands in many ways of the, of the, um, of the art directors, copywriters, and, and most importantly, really the account handlers. So it became a unique and defined um, role within the industry. And it's all built around this. What was created in 1970s is eerily um, still incredibly applicable to what we're, to what we're doing now, and, and we shouldn't forget that. Um, but just to set the scene, really, in terms of we, we, we've talked about what we try to do for our clients, but the process in which we go by to do so is, um, is cyclical, cyclical and is, you know, has been the same. If it's, if, it's, if it's not broke, don't fix it for many years because, it, it, you know, there's a, there's a simplicity and an elegance in, in that simplicity with this model. But it all starts with an identification of where we are now, which then leads to, well, actually, why, why are we here? So identifying the reasons behind those, the, the, the situation that we're in at the moment importantly setting visions for where we want to go and with where we want to be and then this is where the designing of the plan um the the, the creation of the strategy so to speak um it comes into play with how do we actually get to where we want to be and then we get into a moment of uh, of assessment as to where as to actually have we reached where we want to be and of course as i say that's cyclical um because it's not just about designing one solution it's about constantly referring back to that and seeing how that uh, how, how that can be improved um also just to touch on i mean to define strategy is a very difficult thing i think we're often asked to do that by clients who aren't as au fait with strategy as a discipline and um i mean uh, our, our boss back here um, back at base says it's it's kind of putting stuff in boxes um because uh, it's a very difficult thing to to to, to really um describe as in, in terms of what we do but um if we look back at you know those jwt days back in the 70s and and really how planning has been done and strategy has been strategy has been done by consumer agencies it's it's all about understanding our, our our clients business so what is the product that they're trying to sell what are their uh, their strategic imperatives or their business objectives so we have to understand that side of the world but we also importantly need to bring a consumer voice into that. So we need to delve deeply into the psychology and the desires of our, of our audience, but also importantly understand their needs um, because there's no point in, um, in, in just pushing something in people's faces and assuming that they're gonna like it because it satisfies business needs. It also has to satisfy uh, consumer needs. So those two things come together into that definition of strategy, which then, of course, in all classic agencies, it's about that working together with uh, whoever sits on that on that communication side. So whether that be a medical writer or or, or a promotional copywriter or or um, a creative team, um, 
But the difference in the world that we're in, um, everybody on this line, is that we don't live in a world of simplicity. In fact, there's chaos in the world that we in in, in which we operate. Um, and on top of that chaos, there's a, there's a huge number of players as well, a huge number of different audience types that we need to take into consideration, which, of course, um, based on the four disciplines that we have uh, uh, at Langland, you know, we're touching some of those more than others in the different disciplines. But also across that journey, we know that there's differences in medical literacy, that value means different, there's values derived from different areas for different audiences, um, and also the ability to, uh, to communicate um, the patient's voice throughout these, uh, throughout these audiences is quite, an, quite often a challenge. So we live in a world of chaos. And, and in order to bring and a world of, of, of many different audiences. So in order to bring some sort of order to that chaos and to, uh, to be able to, uh, to communicate deeply to a scientific audience, science also needs to form part of that strategy in our world. And when we say science, it's all about the truth of the data, the clear singularity um, that we're trying to get across in terms of our scientific messaging, um, but also that idea of truly understanding the nuanced difference between different scientific communities. So they, then what we have is actually a much more comprehensive, and if you ask me why I'm in, uh, why I'm in the world of, of healthcare and medcoms, the reason will be because it is a more complex world. So the job becomes even more difficult to simplify that. Um, but also importantly, that's why we have defined in many ways um, that, that, that separate role that exists here at Langland. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll go around and we'll just kind of introduce a little bit more um, what we're responsible for when it comes to the designing of, the, of, those, um, of, of those programs to overcome challenges. Um, so from my perspective, what you guys will see on screen, uh, hopefully in front of you, is a representation of blueprints. And, you know, to, to use this analogy to carry it through in terms of, of how we work together, really, from my perspective, it's about defining that problem right from the get go with the clients and understanding, um, you know, actually what they're trying to solve. It's no good for clients to come to us with solutions often. And um, what we want is to, to really get to the core of, of of what that problem is and from there start to put in place those clear blueprints of, a, of, of what, what that solution could begin to look like. Um, but importantly, it's at a very high strategic level at this point. Um, but of course, I would work with, uh, with, with Emily as well on, on the scientific strategy side. Yeah, so for us um, in particular, when we're working um, with brand strategy, so to carry again an analogy that you can see we're working with here. So kind of one sort of the brand planners or brand strategists set that blueprint. It's kind of really our job to come in and help with those foundations. Um, and in particular, very much about um, you know, where we're taking that brand from a scientific perspective. And um, again, quite often coming from the advertising um, side of things, it's very much about finding the human truth and the emotional side. The scientific strategy really makes sure that everything we're grounded in is from that scientific perspective, but it's what can that product actually truly stand for? Um, so again, back to Lee's point about making the complex simple, it's also kind of what our role is as well. As we know in the world of medcoms, there's so much medical data, it's so vast. So we're really, really trying to find that kind of red thread um, that can really pinpoint within there to kind of take us forward with it. Um, you know, we're, we both come at things sort of slightly differently. So sort of brand strategy, like brand planning, we'll still look at things from a human um, sort of HCP and patient perspective. We also do that in scientific strategy as well, but just from a different frame. And we make sure that we're both bringing it together. So we have that unique um, point of view that is kind of covering all bases, if you like. Um, and then as we're building that kind of foundation within there, we obviously work very, very closely um, with the medical writing team, again, across um, sort of disciplines. Um, but this is when we work with medical writing and um, so quickly with Kelly in particular, kind of helping us with that strategy and, and kind of build upon sort of that soul walk within there. But Kelly, I'll let you speak to that. Um, yeah, so um, as writers, we, we do work really closely with the scientific strategists, you know, to establish that foundation. I think it's really important that we, um, as the content creators, are feeding into um, into that foundation before we start creating anything. Um, you know, we put our insights in, our knowledge. Um, and as Emily said, it's all about um, kind of identifying that key data and those messages that will really speak to our audience. Um, you know, we want to build, um, you know, create clear, engaging content um, that really does uh, 
convey the messages that we're trying to convey um, based on our foundation. And so finding that key data that bolsters all of those messages is really important to do up front because that's then going to be carried all the way through a, a narrative um, and um, we need to align with those kind of strategic objectives all the way through. So it's really good to align on that um, up front. Brilliant. Um, so, I mean, ho hopefully it's becoming quite clear how we, how we all integrate together and how, and how we work well together um, as well. I mean, oftentimes a, a good way of looking at this is that from a brand strategy focus or from a brand strategy perspective, our focus is truly on the idea of how do we build a brand around the product? Whereas I think in, in many ways, a scientific strategy is a, is what's that truth that lives within the product, so to speak. So it's that the colliding of worlds of brand and product come together with then, you know, Kelly and her team articulating that in the, in, in terms of how the content is then deployed. And, and of course, as we say, we're all, we're all working um, into one another and feeding into the process throughout, which hopefully the, um, the next few slides, uh, sorry, next slide will, uh, will, will demonstrate. Um, so what we've done here is, is take a, um, and of course, we're not putting any um, client names or information here, um, but we um, we want to talk through a quick example of how we actually have in practice worked together as a um, as a triumvirate um, in terms of a, of this dual indication campaign that was um, requested of us um, in the respiratory field. And so, what you'll see as well, just down in the bottom left hand corner, is a, is a little key there to to understand um, as we start to build this chart. Um, so the first, the first point of involvement, really, um, <clears throat> the first time we have that connection with a client is really, as I mentioned earlier before, is about not jumping to solutions. It's about trying to really define what that problem is. Um, so when we had our clients come to us with this particular challenge in mind, we had to work with them to kind of massage it a little bit and take that step back and assess the context in which we're operating. Um, and really, to, to give you to give you a little bit more detail on this, the, the definition, the problem that we really were trying to solve here was that we, we had launched with one indication in, in, in most markets globally, and we were bringing a new one into it. And the, the, the difference in terms of how these diseases are perceived the diff by, by healthcare communities, um, by, by the marketing team, by, by everybody involved, um, was something that we needed to understand, right? So we needed to define really truly what, what that problem was and, and where we came to was this idea that um, actually there's a key difference in terms of, um, of, of how these two diseases are perceived. And as a result, there's a very difficult, um, there's a very difficult area to overcome in terms of bringing them together in, in one unified um, sale or one unified promotion. So that, that was the first step really. Um, then we moved on to, to the insight gathering, which was, um, you know, uh, as, as Emily mentioned, we kind of attacked this from different angles. From my perspective, it was truly delving more deeply into understanding the behavior of those HCPs, why they saw a difference between these different disease areas, um, and not only disease areas, the patients within those disease areas, what their perceptions of them were, um, and 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 uh, you know any further detail into the true desires of these of these and needs of these audiences. And I think just from from my perspective, so the way that I came at this is very much looking at the, the disease itself. Um, <clears throat> again, without sort of saying too much about who it was, it was obviously two indications within sort of one kind of disease landscape area. And what we were really, really trying to get at with our insight gathering here was we had to find a commonality between the two diseases. So as we started uncovering with a lot of the insights, we were actually finding there's a lot more disparity than there was commonality. Um, and really the, the question we asked to us is what is that one kind of single-minded insight that we could find within here that would really unify things, obviously, from all perspectives. And um, again, I very much looked at the I think it was obviously in collaboration. So when we we're looking at things from the HCP perspective, um, it was making sure it was grounded in actual sort of real science, real data within there. Um, <clears throat> so we covered quite a lot of ground, I think, within sort of the insight gathering within here. Um, and our purpose, obviously, with this as well is we wanted to take this forward to um, a particular sort of KOL council. Um, the company had a, a particular terminology of, of how they kind of um, coined it. Essentially, what we did was we, we came up with sort of um, 
five different hypotheses of what we thought linked these two conditions together. Um, we worked through very much from sort of the, the scientific MOA perspective, but again, ladder it really, really back up to that kind of um, emotional standpoint and what this meant for not only the physician, but the patients as well. Um, and I guess quite similar across sort of within medcoms, as you would run sort of an ad board, we took this to a panel, I think it was about eight physicians, um, and we kind of um, sort of interviewed them with these hypotheses. Um, we also used sort of different, different ways to get our, our insights within here as well, kind of looking at real life um, HCP and patient interactions. We actually managed to um, have school transcripts into that. So although a lot of what we were sort of doing was based on hypotheses, it was sort of grounded in truth and facts within there as well. Um, and that, that was kind of my role to help sort of mediate that within there um, obviously taking it to that kind of council um, and how we would normally run an ad board, taking learnings from there to how we can approach um, the physicians within this space where, because it was hypotheses, it's a little bit more arbitrary. So how, how do we make sure we're getting obviously the, the absolute best from the physicians within there? Um, and through, through our insight, we actually did come to, to those kind of common, common insights. Um, and once we came out from there, we kind of validated. We had some where the physicians were like, absolutely not. You're completely off the mark within there. Um, but it allowed us to really get to the point of understanding. And I think we came out with them um, sort of one or two that were kind of clear, clear winners within there. Um, so from there, our kind of next steps from that is taking us into briefing. And I'll pass it back to you if you want to take a question. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think as well, I mean, it, probably everybody who's been on Peter's um, webinar has, has spoken about, you know, system one and system two and the, you know, the, the reptilian brain and the slow moving brain versus the fast moving brain. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, it's everybody's spoken about it because it's I mean, it's it's something that's it's truly embedded in what we do. And just to cover that off as well, I think, um, you know, there's two sides to every coin. There's the emotional and the rational. So. As you know, as Emily is saying, we have to be making sure that the science is is it, you know we're talking from a point of truth, but also at the same time we're also dealing with complex humans and we need to understand what their perceptions are. Um, so it's not just um, it's not just all about that focus on, on on the system too. We're also looking at that immediate response as well. Um, with regards to the briefing. And um, for the for the you know for the sake of simplicity, we haven't built this out into the into where the creative brief took us. Um, but it's more of a point to, to, to illustrate here that um, you know, Emily and I were working in tandem um, with two separate deliverables. One was for the creative brief, which would you know, ultimately um, result in, in, in a full creative campaign, um, you know, a, a new visual identity and creative campaign. Um, and the other being, um, you know, more of more of how we take this from a story perspective. Um, but you know, one thing that we we focus on um, on both sides of that coin um, is this idea of perspective gathering. Um, so it's all about taking perspectives from different areas, whether that be society, uh, people, business, or science, and and we bake those into into both the, the different types of brief that we wrote, we write. So. Um, from, from a creative perspective, maybe more focused with on the people, um, and then perhaps a bit more of a focus on the science from the story flow perspective. Yeah, the story flow is definitely more grounded in science. And I think the interesting challenge we had about this brief was we had to write for a global audience as well as a US audience. Um, and in particular, the data was very different from US to global as well. What we could say in the US, we couldn't say globally, we've all kind of been there and vice versa. Um, but in particular, the nuance within the data was so slight. I remember going around, we had something could say sustained, something could say significant, something it was very, very intricate in terms of what we could and couldn't say. And um, so the focus with the story flow brief, obviously, because this was coming from a kind of more of a commercial client, was sitting in the advertising side, we had to make sure that all of our writing still laddered up to um, you know, an overall story that was going to have that kind of um, sharp, sharp, that was telling in a succinct way, but it was really, really important to make sure it was grounded in the science. And um, particularly when we looked at our competitors, we had no head-to-head -head data in this space, um, and everyone was trying to claim sort of very, very similar. So we had to get quite creative with our writing within there. 
Um, and I think in particular, um, so we have sort of the orange dot kind of circling over Louis and myself because we did lean quite heavily on the writing team within here. So they fed into the brief, particularly the story flow brief within here because it was so data heavy. Similar with the creative briefs as well, um, because it was going to a lot of our copywriters, but because the data points, they were writing for a US audience and a global, we had to make sure that they were very specific and we had a client. So although she was commercial, she could pick up on p-values if it was on the wrong. So she was very, very trained and honed in on that. So we had to make sure we had not only the scientific storytelling within there, but the rigor that kind of came through. So um, this is kind of where obviously Kelly came in as well. So Kelly, I don't know if you want to pick up for the you know, I've been chatting. Well, no, it, it, everything you've said is, you know, absolutely bang on. I think um, this is why it is really important that the writers are kind of um, brought in um, up front in the briefing stage, just to ensure that actually what we're claiming and the direction that we're going can be substantiated by rigorous data, um, because um, ultimately that is what underpins everything we do and should do. Um, so yeah, it was, it's a really key part of that upfront stage. But as you say, it's really important to be bringing in that emotional side as well as the, as well as the data, because we also want these pieces to really connect with the target audience. Um, and uh, and that's, that's a big part of what we do actually. So um, bringing all of our kind of specialties together at this point is a really important part of creating that foundation for the rest of what we do. I think with that content creation as well, just to touch on it, um, sorry, <laughs> there's obviously, um, when we kind of took that forward, again, although it was very, very much led by the writing team, so myself and Lou would still have those touch points, we still make sure that, you know, all of us are aware of that strategy, because at this point, it was very much, obviously, the writing team leading this, so they have to write from that, obviously, strategic perspective, so I think it was just we had a light touch in just to make sure that it was all just kind of hitting along and um, particularly from our different client perspectives as well within there. And um, so throughout this whole process, I think one of the main words we said at the start was this collaboration. Yeah, and um, it, it is, um, as we said, the, the um, we as writers will look really deeply into into that content and and look at where the the most relevant kind of um accurate data is and ladder up to that story flow that's been created up front um it's you know structuring it based on that foundation creating kind of clear messages um and like you say tailoring it to different audiences and tailoring it to different markets um, it's important that we bring the kind of compliance side in and also then having it at the front of our minds that um, we are aligning to those strategic imperatives um, as well. So we're bringing all of those things um, in as we as we are creating the kind of the full content, the full um, story flow. Um, and I think we come together at lots of different stages of content generation as well. So, you know, that first draft, but also touch points throughout to make sure that we're aligning with the original concept and across brands as well. So obviously everything we do will need to span um, uh, both brand and product. Um, so um, it's important that we kind of do keep those touch points and, and make sure we're bringing all of those um, elements together. There's a lot, like you say, making the complex simple, but there's a lot actually, um, I think, not everybody realizes when you just write content uh, that actually you're bringing in the subtle nuance, the type of language, um, it, you know, and also then underpinning it with really strong data. Um, the differences in, in wording can make a real difference to the connection with people. So, and even how you create those pieces. So um, that the format that it comes in, that makes a difference to how it connects with people. So all of these things are taken uh, taken into consideration as as the content is generated so um, it's a really exciting process to be part of to be honest especially when we get to work with um, both of your skill sets as well and then we get to the point where we all sit in a dark room somewhere in France and you know look through a double Behind a mirror or yeah. something. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean I, in, in all honesty I think 
there there is an excitement to market research as well. And you know, from from a from a brand strategy point of view, uh, my my involvement in that would be contributing heavily to discussion guides. Um, you know, working with market research teams to to really to really kind of try to get um, emotional responses as well as as well as um, you know truly logical and rational responses. Um, and, and, and understand actually what what is making what is making people make these decisions so what, what's the what's the psychology underlining all of that as well um but i'll hand over to em from from the science perspective yeah i think um from our perspective and again just particularly using this one as an example um you know i think louis would lead very much on that sort of discussion guide so we feed into that with the market research teams and um, for anyone that's never kind of done or been on with market research, essentially what happens is that that content creation um, that Kelly seems involved in, that is kind of acts as your stimulus, which is then put into to market research, which is fully blinded. Um, and it's done by an independent agency. And essentially, as, as Louis said, we all kind of dial in and they don't kind of they know we're on the phone, but no one kind of sees you. Um, and then essentially it's obviously presented to them and there's a series of questions. So it's kind of our job and particularly, I guess, from a scientific strategy perspective is, is the way that we're presenting the data, the way that it's coming across, is that kind of what we call sort of the hero PCs, the hero data, is that coming through? Is that sort of landing? Do they remember that? So we really make sure that the questions that we're asking is getting us to the point of understanding is, again, it's coming back to that aspect of the product. So I think we're really making sure that the product from a scientific strategy perspective is coming through. And I think with Louis, it's obviously that kind of brand perspective is kind of all laddering up um, within there. And then obviously um, we all sort of listen in. I think it's our major role and it's, it's really important as well, I think at this point to have so all the writers um, who are working on this and touching this on the market research, because although you get reports that come out, and again, I don't know if anyone's ever sat on a, a, a download of a market research report, and um, basically the, the agency themselves, and um, you know, they take all the insights and all the findings and present it back, but there's nothing truer than actually sitting in and listening to what that physician is saying, because there's nuances about language and um, particularly again if it's across markets so um translation some words that we think absolutely fine does not translate well to german for example and um, so there's all these little nuances that kind of you get from just listening to that market research so it can be kind of time time labor and um, but it really does help to kind of have sort of all of our teams on that market research within there I think you'd be surprised as well, actually, how when you when you hear feedback firsthand, how you can hear the difference in people's tone of voice as well and how they really they they truly feel about something. People speak quite passionately about what they do and how they see um, their patients and things like that. So um, actually being there firsthand can really make a, a difference to then integrating that within the content. Um, and any changes that then have to go on to be made. Um, definitely seeing that firsthand um, and also actually live kind of evaluating what feed what the feedback is and the data that we have in order to support that. Sometimes suggestions are made and it may seem like a good idea, but actually we, we can't substantiate it. So it's nice to also be there to be able to kind of see if there's any key data that we have in our knowledge as writers that we could already bring, you know, bring to that um, when it comes to then starting to amend the content. Um, yeah, it's a really good thing to be part of as well. Nice segue into that as well, Kelly, because I think um, one of the things with m the market research, and I guess is both myself and, and Louis's job within there is to, um, you know, take the findings um, and sometimes is that you know, how's, how's the work going to get adapted? What learnings have we taken from the market research? Um, generally speaking, so I know for the story flow, for example, we tested different story flows, kind of what worked well. So we come out with this kind of optimized story flow. So then that goes back to, you know, we can tweak the brief. Do we, is it a full rebrief sometimes? I think we've maybe sat in research where completely everything is bombed and then we're back to, to square one with that but kind of every learning is a learning and um, helps us with the direction of where we go and then obviously that's back to how we shape that content and then that's kind of taken us right through to full tactical implementation within there. Brilliant perfect so I mean I think that concludes our presentation today so um, I'll, I'll stop sharing now Peter and I guess open the floor for, for the Q&A.
Fantastic. Thank you very much, guys. OK, um, we have got just a few minutes to, to talk and I would remind the audience to um, to chip in with your comments and, and observations and questions um, using either the chat box or the Q&A box. It doesn't matter to us. A um, couple of quick questions from me. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Just an, just an immediate question um, and, and, and a straightforward question in terms of the market research you do. Is that um, have you got market research within the organization or is that is that tending to be done by a third party market research company? Yeah, that will be that will be done by third party, but, but typically, yeah, yeah, typically. But with, um, I mean, we have run some ourselves, um, uh, some more minor stuff. But yeah, deep collaboration with the with the market research team. So it's not just an off the shelf model. It's it's truly um, created for for the needs that we need it for. Yeah. Okay, but just picking up on the comment that came in from anonymous here, because um, I, I did wonder slightly the same thing as you were talking. You were talking about insights gathering as something that you were doing yourselves. And then the market research is something that's done by somebody else. And I guess the, the question is, is that not the same sort of thing? And how, how do you distinguish that? And why is one inside and one outside? And so I just talk to his point. I say him, sorry, anonymous, him or her, uh, their point um, a little bit. Yeah, See what yeah I mean? no, I, I think I think that's a I think it's a great question, to be honest. Um, the thing is, everything that we do should be driven by insights, right? There's no point in creating something unless we know truly what what what's in the hearts and souls and minds of our of, of our audience and importantly the data and the, and the response to that but the early stage for insight gathering could very well involve market research it depends on how how we do it oftentimes there has been historic market research that we that we move through we digest we understand other times we um we you know we go straight to the source and directly interview people for, our, for, for from our own perspective we also have a full social media strategy team here as well at Langland, where we uh, we we oftentimes work in collaboration with them to to scrape social media and and, and pull some things out for us in that perspective. But yeah, I mean, uh, there, there's no one size fits all in this. Um, it's a combination of the different tools and expertise that we can lean on um, ourselves internally to give us the biggest picture. Um, then what the, the latter stage that we've referred to as, as market research within that, within that diagram is all about testing of the stimulus that we've created rather than using market research as an opportunity to, to gain insights about our, our audience and the, and the context in which they operate. Sorry, okay, that makes sense. Again, oh, sorry, you, you go, go, sorry. I was going to say, that's the thing about the market research is it's very much having it as a third party, it's kind of like marking your own work. So to make sure having someone yeah. else at that opposite end is, you know, we don't have any bias involved in that then. So that's why it's kind of that third party. Okay, that makes sense. I'm going to carry on throwing a couple of questions at you. And um, Annette, you talked about agencies are all shapes and sizes and whatever. And and it, it, again, listening to you talking, I think it's an important point to make because some people are coming and watching this and are finding out about Medcoms, for instance. And there's a big spectrum, long spectrum of, of different sorts of agencies approaching things in different sorts of ways. And uh, I find it interesting listening to this sort of presentation because when I started Medcoms, it was very project based. You know, we want this, we want that, and you did it. And um, but is it fair to say, I'm being a little bit careful what I'm saying here, but, you know, listening to you talk, it sounds quite a commercially driven, um, um, brand driven environment you're in, as opposed to a publications planning type. And, and is that true or not? If it's not quite true, do you take the same sort of approach with less brand driven things? And is it a reflection of the greater publicist type of environment? There was a couple of questions in there, but I just want to try and paint a bit of a picture for people watching this and wondering how this relates to other sorts of medcoms type agencies. Yeah, I mean? so I, th I think what we've presented here is, is you know, the sort of some of the work that we do that, that sits cross, cross discipline as, as we sort of, you know, started with. And not everything is. You know, probably 25% of our work is cross-discipline. Um, and in the MSE team where our medical writers sit, you know, we do <laughs> med ed projects like, you know, in other, you know, independent right. med ed agencies. Okay. We do have the advantage that we can draw on expertise from the other disciplines, which is actually really useful. So we can, you know, we can, you know, say, oh, actually, you know, let's get somebody in from our CT team, for example. They do loads and loads of stuff with patient materials because it's all about uh, recruiting patients into trials and keeping them there, et cetera. So, 
I might, you know, we might have a, a project that comes along and, and there's a there's a lot of patient kind of focused things and we might say, okay, let's get Vicky, our creative director in from there because she's got some really great insights and she's really experienced right. and her team can develop that. So it's nice to be able to draw on those things, but it is also true that every project is different and not every project is, is, like, is like this one. So we don't tend to focus too much on publications in, in all honesty. I suppose we are kind of, I think we are in this big sort of advertising network, so to speak. So yeah. it's probably not our sweet spot in terms of, Med Ed, but we do do the full suite of Med Ed activities. We do do some publications um, as well. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of, you know, sometimes we, sometimes, uh, you know, a writing team is expected to be strategic, of course, like any other uh, company. And, you know, on some projects, our writers will lead on the strategy. Um, on others, they work alongside a scientific strategist. It really depends on the project. And in, and in fact, what the client wants, you know, not everybody, not every client, comes to us wanting a big strategic, you know, involvement. I think we, you know, we've got the sort of scientific strategists and the writers because we really wanted to sort of elevate both writing and strategy. Um, and, you know, when we have those big strategic pieces of work that come in, like the brand planning side of things, then that means that our strategists can really, really focus on that, supported by the writers without sort of taking away from, you know, all the other things that the team is, is doing. So, and of course, some writers, um, and, and some writers don't necessarily even want to do the strategy. Some some people do, some people don't. Uh, some people really want to focus on really solid, good quality, you know, execution that just you know nails it from a from that point of view. So, um, yeah, long winded answer. Sorry, but hopefully answer. No, that, that's fine. I just want I just wanted to try and get a bit more of a picture of that because and it just simply comes down to you know everyone's different and and I just like to think that people are, are listening to you and getting a picture but also understanding that there are different pictures sort of thing and um, again another question do you um find conflict is that the right way of putting it between you trying to provide strategy and the client saying i should do strategy or looking at it differently do you sometimes think well hang on a second the client should be determining their strategy rather than just offloading it onto us am i asking that in the right sort of way is there a conflict in there are you understanding what I'm trying to get at, Louis? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I see where you're coming from. Um, I think personally, we would we will have failed if a client gives us their strategy and tells us to operate. That's not how we operate. We 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 are there as client partners to uh, to embed ourselves upstream and and help them define you know ultimately what will lead to success for their brand. Um, so the. I mean, again, it's, you know, an in, it's an independent thing. There are some clients that have, you know, deep, deep strategic knowledge and, and are, are very equipped in that space. Um, but we would always, always want them to be working with us to the point that, you know, if we, if we weren't able to be involved upstream, we, we would have to really seriously consider the relationship. Um, so um, that, yeah, our, our, our role is to, is to help them on their journey. Um, so we're not just defining their strategy for them, it, uh, you know, again, coming back to this point of collaboration and perspectives that, you know, that we really, um, really do care deeply about and, and really value here at Langland. More perspectives are better than one. So uh, it, there shouldn't be this attitude of we'll just take it on or they just take it on. We, we need to truly work together. OK, OK. And again, I'm going to be a bit quick with this. A couple of questions now because we are running out of time, but um, it's, it's coming out of a couple of questions that have come in as well. Um, I suppose my question was um, uh, Emily and Kelly, really, from different points of view. But you know, are, are your scientific strategists ex-writers? Does a writer want to become a strategist? You've you've suggested some do, don't, whatever. But uh, let's start with with Emily. I mean, as a strategist, I, I'm not quite sure. You come, up, I think I'm right in saying you come up through the writing route. Mm -hmm. But is that is that part of the development? Sorry, guys. Sorry. Yeah. Cool, thank right. you. Um, but is that part of the idea? You know, you're writing, you're content creating, and you're becoming strategists. Or I, I'm being slightly silly with my question but you know again what I'm trying to say and I'm just yeah. interested in the backgrounds and how one becomes the other yeah essentially the, the route in um I think I, I mean I came from the writing route um I wouldn't necessarily say that's the only route in that you need to come from it I think you know I think you ask anyone's history of medcoms there's always a how did you fall into this sort of area there's always kind of written within there I think when I first came into writing, I was actually exposed to sort of um, the brand strategy team quite early on. So I think for me, it was already that kind of, I, I like doing the strategy side of things, to be honest. And I think for me, that interest just grew over time. Um, and obviously, one of the amazing things with Langland is we do have the different disciplines. I was exposed to advertising quite a lot. So I think it just naturally, my role 
kind of evolved from that way. Um, I think everyone else is slightly different though. I think people in our team have come from different backgrounds. I think, again, it's, I think to your point as well, you said earlier, it's down to the person. So, and I think to what Annette said as well, you know, not everyone likes doing strategy or wants to do strategy. So I think it's all to that kind of, what is the level of interest and desire and, and kind of comfort with doing it as well. Okay, cool. And then Kelly, I'm going to put you on the spot. You know, you're the writer, but are you heading in the strategic direction, if that's the right way of phrasing that? Um, I, I, I uh, love the concept of strategy. I think it's really important in what we do as writers, as we've already talked about. But um, as Annette touched on as well, you know, as writers, we, we're charged with bringing that strategy through content. Um, and so I still get to be involved from a strategy perspective, but I get to do the other stuff I enjoy, which is generating content and um, kind of overseeing that from an editorial perspective. So um, I personally feel like I get a good balance in my role and our writers at Langland get a good balance in their role um, to be exposed to strategy um, in the work that they do as writers. Um, and as Emily said, her, her passion for that developed as she was exposed to the different disciplines more and the different types of work. So then she realized that was more for her, but we do have um, a nice sort of um, balance of all of those elements in what we do as writers. So it doesn't necessarily mean all the writers are gonna end up scientific strategists. I think we, we get enough of that. And uh, actually I've seen a question about kind of um, training on strategy and bringing that in early and the kind of um, whether we were kind of exposing people to that. And um, we at Langdon do do a lot of training on what strategy is, why it's important, um, the benefits of it, the benefits of each of the roles that we all play and where we can bring that through. And um, it's the same with uh, the training in the writing team is that we we try and make it clear um, in our reviews, for example, um, as to where we can bring in, you know, the, the strategic objectives, where we're laddering up to certain things, how we can do that. And so that also trains the writing team kind of on a day to day basis as well. And we think that's important because as people fall in love with the different sides of medcoms, it's important that, you know, we kind of expose everyone to every angle of it. and make our skill set very um, wide reaching. Yeah, I mean, and just just to build on that as well, I think because it addresses a, a number of the questions that are that are coming through is um, that at Langland there's, there's a system of fluidity and kind of to a degree an element of horizontality as well, right? So is that it's not just experts that live in their boxes. It's not black and white in that sense. And, and I think to address, there was a, a question around medical strategy versus brand strategy. And is it defined in a black and way of commercial versus medical? <clears throat> what we like to kind of draw to, um, as an analogy um, to, to kind of answer that question here at Langland is to brand strategy and, 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 and scientific strategists are like an art director and a copywriter. So any good pair, right? Any any art director worth their salt can write a good line, and any any um, any copywriter worth their salt can come up with a good visual uh, visual idea of how things could look. But they're not their expertise. So we we have the ability to kind of move between and th that element of fluidity. But there are things that we are stronger at than in certain areas than 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 we would be in others. Mm -hmm. And, and okay. different projects require different specialties, as yeah. Annette um, touched on earlier, is that sometimes there isn't necessarily a requirement for lots of input from a strategist, but just maybe the upfront. Um, and then you know that they're around, that you can, um, you know, you can still engage with them and just make sure you're going in the right direction. But there are some things like big brand plans and lots of things where it's really predominantly their expertise. But it's a, it's a great thing actually to be working in a team like this because you get to share the experience and expertise from lots of different areas which allows your own sort of skill set to grow excellent okay look guys we're a little bit over so i'm going to cut through this um, I, I find it interesting i hope other people do just to hear and it, it is a different picture you're painting medcoms is a broad church i hate that expression but you know what i mean and, and and it's an important message to get out there there's a lot of different sorts of ways of going about medcoms as we call it um but it's also changed a lot over the years as i say from like maybe it was very project based when i started sort of thing into this much more sort of strategic type and communications partner type approach and so on different agencies go about it in different ways but um that, that's a strong part of what medcoms is, to, is has evolved into um 
thank you very much for sharing your thoughts and, and some examples from what you do. Um, I know I can speak for you and say that you're very happy for people to contact you via LinkedIn. Um, so please, anyone watching this, do do this is part of the point of this is make contacts and follow up. Okay. Um, if anyone's interested in what I'm doing, medcomsnetworking.com, um, and you'll find lots of information and lots of webinars like this and loads of content over at Network Pharma TV and other places. Uh, so please, and, and I'm always very happy to hear from anybody. So on that note, um, I'm going to say thank you to everybody. I'm going to ask you all to give us a wave, um, tell everyone to stay safe in these rather strange and uncertain times um, and say goodbye. So bye-bye everybody. Thank you very much.